All right, now we're going to look at things from a little different perspective um, with, uh, in the case of female reproductive behavior. Different selective pressures operating on females than on males. And so we need to then look at it, look at this in the appropriate context. And I think it's important to understand that um, there are a lot of interactions that take place between males and females before mating itself takes place. And you've probably seen on various National Geographic and other kinds of uh, public TV programs of these rather elaborate courtship displays that take place uh, between the sexes before mating takes place. And it's really very important. And these, these courtship displays serve some really vital functions as a, a system of communication between the individuals. It communicates issues like are you the correct species? Are you in the appropriate state for reproduction to take place? Are you likely to kill me or not? Because especially for some animals that live more solitary lives, they often don't tolerate the presence of another individual until or unless it happens to be the breeding season. Okay, so. So these courtship displays evolved really as a way to synchronize the activity of the individuals. Rutgers is famous, actually. A Rutgers faculty member is famous for some work that was done um, more than 50 years ago on the ring dove. And if you've ever watched um, out your window, doves, morning doves, or, or even pigeons, they have very similar behavioral sequences. And the really cool thing about the study that was done by Dr. Lehrman um, at Rutgers Newark was he was able to measure changes in behavior and changes in endocrinology of the male and the female as they approached each other. And what would happen is, as one animal saw the other, this animal endocrinology changed, which then led to a behavior change. That behavior change caused a change in behavior of the receiver here, whose endocrinology changed. And this chaining, this network of changes of both behavior and, and behavior led to eventual both mating and then even the uh, nest, the care of the nest and the, and the uh, care of the eggs that were laid. So a series of changes in testosterone and estrogen and prolactin that, that came about because of the sequential dis displays, courtship displays, that took place between these individuals. So very important uh, communication going on between males and females. And importantly, the other thing to note is females have a greater investment in reproduction than males. What do I mean by that? Gestation is a part of it, but it goes earlier to that. Oocytes are huge and sperm are small. Oocytes are expensive, sperm is cheap. Now, if you're also, if you gestate and then you lactate, you've now increased the, the cost or the investment in your, in your offspring that much more. Plus, you're limited. If you're, if you're not just broadcasting eggs out into the ocean for, the, for another species to fertilize, you're not likely, you're, you're not going to be fertile all the time and you're not going to be receptive all the time. So for most mammals, the females are only receptive to the males at a, particular, at a fairly defined period of time that we call estrus. It's around the time when they ovulate. It makes sense. It especially makes sense for these animals that have, um, where the, uh, uh, where the spe for those species, where the males fight and compete among themselves. Because remember last time I talked about how big they get. Well, in some cases for these species where you have these very large males where the sex dimorphism is dramatic, in other words, the different sizes of the males and females is so great, sex is dangerous for the females. They can be crushed, beaten, sometimes they're accidentally crushed when the males are fighting one another. So sex is a risky proposition for females. It's important huge investment in their oocytes and their developing offspring. So they need, to, they need to be choosy in a way. And by need, I'm kind of being anthropomorphic here. But they've evolved to be somewhat choosy. And they've evolved to not put themselves at that risk 
when, fertil when conception is not likely to take place. Males, on the other hand, are selected to like get sperm out there and get sperm on every possible female you can because what have you got to lose? Whereas females have a lot more to lose, so they tend to be choosier and, and more selective about that time when they're likely to be receptive. So there's a very different sequence to reproductive behavior in males and females because evolution's operating on them in a different way. So for, and that's pretty self-evident, I think, and we've known of this for a very long time. Historically, in the understanding and the literature on female sexual behavior, all the focus was on just this idea of when the female is receptive. Will the female allow a male to mate? And not as much attention was paid to what are the other behavioral events that lead up to the potential mating. Because as it turns out, as I said before, if you only have a limited number of opportunities to produce offspring because of all the time you spend caring for the ones you do produce, maybe it makes sense. Maybe the strategy of being choosy about who you mate with would have been selected. In fact, we know that it has. So females are rather choosy when given the opportunity. So there are a number of things that, that females either do or signals that they elicit in one way or another, or appearances of them that can change in one way or another, that can influence the behavior of the male. And this idea of, of looking at the behavior of the female from multiple perspectives began uh, with this individual, Frank Beach, who decided to look at behavior of a wide range of species, behavior of the female, and try to understand something about the function of the different observations that he was making. And what he, what, his name was Frank Beach. I think I talked to him a little briefly on Tuesday, um, what we call the, whom we call the father of behavioral endocrinology. He came up with three distinct sort of, I'll call them functional categories, in which different behaviors, no matter what species you're looking at, might, might be represented. And so the first one I'm going to talk about is this idea called attractivity. So attractivity is defined as follows. It's the female's stimulus value, and I'll have to come back and explain that a little bit, in evoking sexual responses by the male. Stimulus value in evoking sexual responses from the male. So when I go walk into my group of goats, and they all look pretty cute to me, by the way, and I look at them, can I tell by looking at them which one is perhaps being exposed to elevated levels of estrogen at that time, maybe she's coming into heat now or soon. Can I tell by looking at them? Probably not. Can a buck? Probably yes. Why? Well, buck's got a different sensory system than I, than I do. It's able to pick up on cues that the female might be eliciting that I can't see, but that are there. We know they're there, and I'll, and I'll explain in a few moments. So how do we measure something like attractivity in a female if they all look cute, if they all look the same to you, to us, and we're interested in it. What do we do? How do we measure attractivity? What would you do? Why not measure the behavior of the male when he's near these females? The male may do some things that tell you oh, that female's more attractive than that female. The male's running over and checking out that one. The male's trying to mount that one. The male is calling out to that one. That's a way that we can measure the attractiveness, the attractivity of the female. So we actually <clears throat> can measure attractivity, but we do it by looking at the behavior of the male <clears throat> in response to females in different states. <clears throat> so practically speaking, <clears throat> Here for cattle. So this picture shows what's known as a group of sexually active cows. It's kind of like the painting that I showed for my office. Yes, Sam? Um, I was just going to ask, after you look at the male to see how he responds to that yes. female, do you then do <clears throat> tests on that female to see like, if there's elevated like, hormones? You can. That would, be, that would be an idea. So what is it about that female's physiology that brought about that change in the male's behavior? That's a classic kind of question that, yes, you would ask. So <clears throat> here in this picture, we see uh, there's a group of females. They're all clustered together. This particular female is sniffing at the anogenital region of this one. 
If you're a male, remember what I told you from, from that painting that I showed you, you see this activity. This is very, this lures you to now investigate. This is a highly attractive scene. This female, likely this is the female that the male will come down and begin to investigate. He might check out this one too because no harm in checking out everybody, but I promise you, the first one he's gonna look at, he's gonna investigate himself, is going to be this one. So just this presentation of her rear end to this animal, and this animal's examination of here, is a signal to the male. This is some way that we can say, ah oh, yeah, there's something going on here that's of interest, that's drawing the attention of the male. If you've worked with horses, you know <clears throat> the changes that take place to mares as they come into estrus. <coughs> Excuse me. You see this um, behavior referred to as vulval winking, where, where um, as they come into estrus, the tail can either swish or get deviated to the side, and then actually the, the, uh, the estrogens at the time cause an enlargement and a change in the coloration of the vulva, and it actually you see this opening and closing, you see frequent urinations. That's highly attractive. Now in that case, we can see that, we can measure, we can measure that. But this is a very potent signal that males pay attention to and, and stallions will, will attend to. So this is the idea, this is not her being receptive. We're not measuring whether she's willing to stand for a male, but we're looking at you know, what kinds of traits are present in the female that may draw the attention of the male. <clears throat> so that's, that's attractivity. Another category of behavior that, that's one of the ones that really is of interest to me, um, yeah, that's my telephone, sorry, I meant to mute it, is called proceptivity. This is a really interesting one because now it's looking at um, behaviors, specific behaviors that the females do that, that initiate the interactions with the males or often that reinitiate the interactions of the male even after mating has taken place. As it turns out, females play a pretty important role in sort of pacing the kind of activity that takes place with males. So the females play a pretty, a pretty strong role. They're not just the, the recipients of the activities of the male, but they can coordinate the kinds of activities that the males do based on the behaviors that they, that they exhibit. And so for different species, uh, there are a range of behaviors that the females do that basically uh, says to the male, check me out. And I'll show you some examples. Your question first, though. Is this them saying, like, yes, I'm in estrus, or hey, I'm in estrus? It's, it's saying, hey, I'm in estrus. Or it's saying, hey, I'm still. Is it response to the male, or is it? It's typically response to the presence of a male. Okay. Yeah. Though, for some species, because females form these sexually active groups, it may, it happens and attracts other can attract other females as well. And that's sort of how these sexually active groups get formed because you have female signaling and other females who may be uh, uh, responsive to that at the time gather with them. So it's, it's a, quite an active communication. So this particular response, which is kind of a, uh, one that we study quite a bit in our lab in the goat, is called tail wagging. And you'll see the male's nose come in there. There he is. <laughs> this draws males from a distance. So there are, a couple, there are a couple important, really, really important things that are happening. One is the visual cue that drives the males. We know it drives the males nuts. I don't, nuts, I don't know if I have the data. I don't remember if I have the data or not. But we've actually measured an increase in sexual excitement of the males if they get a chance to see that first. Before, the, before they're actually placed with the female. The other thing that you can well imagine that it does is let's say you've got this short fan-shaped clue, fan-shaped tail over the area, your anatomy that's producing all these pheromones and you're doing this. What do you think might be happening there? If you could, if you could detect their pheromones and their odors, you can imagine that you have this wafting from that point of origin out drawing the, male, drawing the male's attention. Okay, that's an error. We've looked at the potency of the visual cue on the behavior of the male. We haven't quite designed the study yet to get at the distribution of the pheromones, but that is something that we, uh, that we want to do. So this idea 
is referred to as proceptivity, reactions by the female towards the male that initiate or maintain interaction. Even subtle things like deflection of the tail. So, you know, typically the tail is blocking access to the genital tract. But by moving the tail out of the way, what you're basically doing is aiding the male. You're allowing him to gain access to your reproductive tract. We see in some species that, not, um, that they will change their postures in certain ways that will allow the male to mount, make it easier for the male to mount. So there are a number of things that females can do that engage, reinitiate, or initiate activities with, with the male, and we refer to them as proceptivity. <coughs> One of the things that females do is they approach males when they're becoming receptive. And sometimes it's hard to see that because the males are pretty aggressive about approaching the females. So then the question is, you know, who's approaching whom? So what we wanted to know for the goats was, um, do the females really care about the males? And how might their concentrations of estrogens influence what they do when there's a male around? So here's some data we collected quite a few years ago um, in which we were um, placed females out in a big yard. And in the center of that yard, we built a small pen and we put a male in that pen. So he's there, but he can't approach the females. But they can choose or to approach him or not. And so then what we did is we went up onto the roof of the nearby building and every hour, for, for, for 24 hours, every hour, for about a 15 minute period, we counted where the females were in that pen. So let's just look for the moment uh, at, the, at the black. This is the control group. There's no male present in the pen in the controls. So the females stayed pretty much uniformly distributed in the pen. So what this is representing is percentage of females that are within one body length of the pen that's holding the male. And these were females that were treated with estrogen. And so they were treated with estrogen right here, pretty much right at this time point of zero. And these are hours across here. And at about 10 to 12 hours after that injection of estrogen, which was the time that we would have guessed based on when we see other behavioral changes in these animals, all of a sudden, something happened. And from being randomly distributed in the pen, it was like somebody threw an electromagnet switch and they all started to approach the male. So that by about 15 hours or so, all the females were now were trying to get access to the male. The females were approaching the male. Okay. A few hours later, interest dropped down to, eh, they didn't care that he was there anymore. If we didn't treat them with estrogen, we saw no approach to the males, other than the random sort of, ooh, what's this animal that's in the pen in here, but they weren't staying here. When these females approached the pen where the male was, not surprisingly, they were all mounting each other and sniffing at each other. There was all sorts of sex, female, female sex, happening around the perimeter of this pen where the male was housed until that single one shot of estrogen sort of wore off its behavioral effects and then the females disappeared. So here we see an example of this approach behavior, which we would argue is, is a pretty significant uh, uh, measure of proceptivity. Now, if you'd seen what the male was doing in that pen, you can quite imagine he's trying to get out of there. He's quite aroused by all these females being present and mounting each other there, but he couldn't, he couldn't get, get out of there. So clearly the females were behaving in such a way that, was, that would have initiated behavior with these males. And it was estrogen dependent, and we'll talk about that estrogen dependence uh, shortly. And then finally, um, uh, the third, remember I said there were three categories, so we looked at attractivity, the stimulus value of the females, proceptivity, the actions by the female to initiate uh, interaction with the males, and then finally receptivity, which is what was sort of in the past the most common trait that was studied for female sexual behavior, and basically, will she stand to be mounted by the male? Female response is necessary and sufficient for the male to achieve intravaginal ejaculation, and that's a measure of of receptivity. And depending upon the species, there are different kinds of, of uh, metrics that are used for measuring the sort of level of recept receptivity. And basically, you know, here's an example of a bull mounting and what appears to be a highly receptive individual. 
Now, if you can see the picture well and you look very carefully, you might notice that what he's mounting is not a female, but I cheated. I, I just like this slide, so I put it in. Those are two males, because I wanted to convince you that males will sometimes <laughs> allow this to take place as well. My point being, though, um, not so much that this is a male here, but rather that receptivity is this response. Often what females, when they're in estrus, will do, and here's, about, here's two, in this case, I, I thought, you know, in, in the interest of fairness, since that one was two males, here's two females. Um, but often what happens when the male mounts, mounts the female is not only will you see the, the tail deflected, but the female will back up towards the male a little bit, just presenting the vagina a little bit easier for access uh, for mating to take place. And that's all part of receptivity. Okay, so why do these things take place? And some of what I'm going to talk about now can apply to males and females, but it's, I thought, a good place to include this topic about um, how hormones change the development of the brain, which then leads to sexual behaviors, and in some cases, sexual behaviors that are, we think of as being more male-like versus sexual behaviors that are more female-like. So it's the sex steroids, estrog estradiol, testosterone, that have their major effects here. But they have their effects, different effects at different times in development. And so we can divide up this, these developmental effects of the sex steroids into uh, what I'll first talk about are the organizational actions of the steroid hormones. So if you think about the word organizational action, think about this in terms of the central nervous system. Sex steroids can organize the central nervous system in such a way that it's prepared to respond later in life to a particular set of circumstances, okay? So the really cool thing about this is that the effects of the sex steroids on the organization of the brain takes place early in development. For most mammals, it takes place in utero. About the first, sometime in the first trimester of fetal development, you have this presence of steroids. I'll show you a diagram uh, in a moment or two that, that creates a change in the brain that becomes a permanent change in the brain. And the behavioral consequences of this change in the brain might not be seen for a long time yet, like maybe till after puberty. But it's during that fetal developmental period, the brain exposure to estrogen becomes so critical. So we call this an organizing or the organizational actions of steroids. It's how the sex steroids organize the central nervous system to behave as a male or a female. So this diagram is in your text and I'll take you through it. Male on this side of the picture, female on this side of the picture. So let's, um, who do I want to start with? Let's start with the female. So here's the brain and within the brain you have uh, areas of the hypothalamus uh, that you may have heard, you've heard about the surge center and the tonic center for the release of GnRH. Well, neighboring areas of the hypothalamus are also responsible for uh, mounting behavior and receptivity and the sexual behaviors. The control centers for most of the ability of the animal to display sexual behaviors are happening in this re sim nearby region of, of this part of the hypothalamus. Now, you have a fetus developing. It, it develops an ovary. That ovary produces estradiol. Not the high levels that you might see as the animal's approaching puberty, but nevertheless, there's estradiol present. And mom has estradiol too, so there's, there's a fair amount of estradiol in this circulation. But the liver, the, baby, the fetal liver, produces a protein abbreviated here, alpha FP. That's alpha feto, like fetus, feto protein. Alpha feto protein. Alpha feto protein is a, is a protein that binds estradiol. So you, the liver's producing this protein, the protein's circulating in the blood of the fetus. The fetus is producing some estradiol, that estradiol's in the blood, and the alpha feto protein binds that estradiol. Now that blood gets up to the brain, but because the brain tissues are protected from, I don't know what just happened to the system. Because the brain tissues are affected, are, are protected 
from large molecules entering them, most proteins are not able to get into the brain from the circulation. So in other words, the brain of a female, even though there may be estrogen in the circulation, is not being exposed to that estrogen because alpha feta protein is binding it. I'm not sure which one of these. We'll see if that works. <clears throat> but you have, hopefully you all have that in front of you. So, you've, you're a female fetus, you've got estrogen in your circulation, but your liver is producing alpha feta protein, so that estrogen is not getting into the brain. That absence of estrogen in the brain leads to what we call the female behavioral phenotype. The female behavioral phenotype. So, the brain becomes female-like in the absence of any estrogen stimulation. This individual becomes female because you see the brain is sort of repelling the estrogen that's present. So what some people used to say is the default uh, uh, phenotype here is a, is a female-like phenotype. Now let's contrast that for a moment with the male. The male is producing, uh, develops a testis. The testis produces testosterone. The male also has alpha feta protein from his liver, but the alpha feta protein is not going to bind testosterone. And testosterone being a nice steroid molecule readily transfers tra uh, into the brain. Now, when it's in the brain, the neurons of the brain convert that testosterone to estradiol. And as a result, this animal becomes defeminized. Remember I said the default in the absence of the steroids is a female phenotype. If you defeminize, you create the male phenotype. Kind of back, funny way of thinking about it, but it's, if you think about the female as being the default, then maybe it makes more sense to think about the defeminization that takes place to males because testosterone can enter the brain. Okay, and so now this is an animal that doesn't have a surge center, that's more likely to mount rather than stand to be mounted, and all the behavioral gender differences that one expects. Now, long ago, there was a study that looked at, <clears throat> uh, experimentally, that manipulated young animals in such a way that they could control what steroids the brain was exposed to during this period of time when the organization of that central nervous system takes place. Remember I said the organizational actions of the sex steroids happen during this per early period during development. We call that a critical period. It's only the steroids have to be present then, and if they're present then, they have their effects. Later, the steroids aren't going to have this kind of effect. So within this critical window, sensitive period, what can you, can you manipulate the exposure to the brain in such a way that you can manipulate the outcomes. And that's what this study did. And it was able to do this because the interesting thing is rats. Have you ever seen a newborn rat? It's all, it kind of looks like a fetus in a way, a little pink thing, no hair, eyes are closed, ears haven't erupted, no teeth. I mean, it's hard to believe that it can survive on its own, right? It turns out the central nervous system of this newborn rat is similar in some ways to, to the fetus of larger animals, and that the sensitive period for the organizing actions of steroids happens in that first week of life after birth in a rat. That turns out to be experimentally pretty cool because now you can take these newborns and treat them with different steroids and then see what happens later in life to them. So that's what this study is sort of summarizing. First two rows are, here were the female fetuses, and what they did with the female fetuses is they treated them with estradiol or with testosterone. And in both cases, that led to a decrease in estrus behavior and an increase in male-like behavior. So you think, wait, does this make sense? Estrogen caused an increase in male-like behavior? Yes, because that's exactly what I was showing on this slide. If the brain is, ex during the critical period, if the brain is exposed to estrogen, whether it's from testosterone it's, or from estradiol itself, you end up with the male-like phenotype. And that's what happened in this experiment when the females were treated with either estrogen or testosterone. You get this defeminization and, and masculinization. Yes? Was the 
guess about the spelling to the alpha ketoprotein? So at, um, you overwhelm it. So you have, so the liver produces so much alpha feta protein enough to bind up the endogenous estrogen. But now, experimentally, they come in and they give it a big wallop, a higher dose. And so there's not enough alpha feta protein to, to protect the brain from its exposure. Good question. They did the, with the male fetus, not too surprisingly, if you add the estrogens or the progesterone or the testosterone, you have no effect because you're basically just repeating what already happened to these animals anyway. The, the endogenous sex steroids defeminized them already. So what we know is that whether in that sensitive period of development, whether the brain is exposed to testosterone or estradiol, it, the phenotype will become defeminized, okay? Now, that describes the organizational actions of sex steroids. Those are these profound changes in the structure of the brain that happens because of the exposure to steroids during a critical period in development, early in life. Now, you come into this animal and it's had its whatever its exposure happened to be, and at some point after puberty, when the females begin to cycle, or when the male's testes are producing high levels of testosterone, and the behavior then changes at that point in a short-term capacity. So the sex steroid can sort of turn on a behavior that's regulated by a part of the nervous system that was organized earlier. And this shorter-term effect of the sex steroids are referred to as the activational actions of steroids. So now exposure to the steroid in this animal that already has an organized nervous system is going to bring about a particular set of changes. So think back to the, pic to the graph that showed the females approaching the male and then leaving the male. So they start out, they don't have much uh, sex steroid present. You give them sex steroid, you see a change in their behavior, and then the sex steroid effects go away and you see the return to behavior, that re baseline return to behavior. A short-term effect of the steroids. You're not changing the structure of the brain of the, animal, of the adult animal, you're changing the function of that structure later in life. Same hormone, the same signaler, testosterone or estradiol, but the effect of that hormone varies depending upon where in life you are. Fetal development, profound, lifelong effects, adulthood, shorter term effects that go away when the hormone goes away. It's kind of an efficient way to use a signal. Same signal, same hormone, but depending upon where you are in your developmental trajectory, the effect of that hormone changes. <clears throat> so what we know from decades of studies across hundreds of different species is that estradiol is required for the expression of sexual behavior in the female. No matter how you get the estradiol, it ha estradiol has to be there. So it could be a precursor to estradiol that ends up giving the animal elevated estradiol. Precursor, for example, being testosterone. But ultimately, if the female is going to display sexual behavior, there will have to have been estrogen present. Now, the other hormone that you're familiar with from the ovary is progesterone. Progesterone is an interesting one here because it can, go, it can work either way. It can either inhibit the expression of sexual behavior in the female or increase the female's responsiveness to estrogen. And that ha that's sort of a temporal effect. So if you imagine in your head for the moment what the hormone changes of estrogen and progesterone are during a typical estrus cycle. Ovulation takes place, right? So you had this buildup of estrogen, pulse of LH, okay? Estrogen levels drop a little bit. Maybe they sort of fluctuate. But after that ovulation, you get the formation of corpus luteum, right? Everybody with me? Progesterone levels go up. They go up. Estrogens come to here. There's no sexual behavior. For the most part, there's no sexual behavior. Now what happens to, if you don't get pregnant, what happens to this corpus luteum? It comes down and then estrogen goes up. And it's that synchrony of the decrease in progesterone 
and the increase in estrogen that brings about estrous behavior. These are coupled events. If progesterone stays high, no estrous behavior takes place. Now, sometimes what happens is if there's been no progesterone and there's estrogen, you might not get sexual behavior occurring either. And that happens typically at, uh, for these animals at puberty. In their first ovulation, you had the increase in estrogen, but they never had a corpus luteum yet. So they didn't have that progesterone that sort of primed the brain to respond to estrogen. Or sometimes after pregnancy, the first ovulation after pregnancy sometimes is not associated with behavioral estrus because you've had this sort of prolonged period of elevated progesterone and estrogen and the brain's just not reset yet. And it takes that first ovulation to kind of reset the cycling again. So progesterone has this complex relationship with estrogen that is of temporal importance. And then uh, finally, is with respect to testosterone, we know it stimulates female sexual behavior as a result of its conversion to estradiol, an enzymatic step called aromatization. Testosterone is aromatized to estradiol. Now, it gets a little more complicated than that, and I just uh, make a reference to one of our studies that was done a number of years ago that suggests maybe there are some differences in the behaviors uh, uh, brought about by exposure to testosterone in estradiol in females, uh, but we don't have time to talk too much about that. Um, there's one other topic I want to cover in our remaining five minutes. Yes? Going back to two slides, when the female fetus is giving estradiol and it shows male-like behavior, we assume that's aromatized Well, so estradiol, it was given estradiol, so there's no aromatization because the aromatiz testosterone gets aromatized to estradiol. If you've got, there's no aromatization. So if you were just to put estradiol, though, wouldn't it just bind to an alpha beta protein or no? Kind of oh, okay. So that's kind of a follow-up to the question asked before. The way the experiment was designed is they were given more estradiol than the alpha beta protein could uh, uh, bind to. So that, that just became a, a, a um, kind of a... Hum uh, too much, yeah. <laughs> All right, quick change, last few minutes, uh, just to kind of um, leave domesticated species for a moment and talk about different mating strategies. Because not all animals solve their mating problems in the same way, and I think it's important that you understand some of these concepts. So I'm going to take you through this idea of different mating strategies. Uh, moving from something called promiscuity to then simultaneous polygamy, serial polygamy, seasonal monogamy, and perennial monogamy. And the way I'm representing this is um, by looking at the formation of pair bonds. So a horizontal line represents the, bo the bonding between a male and a female, and a little dot represents, well, mating takes place, but there's no real bonding between males and females. In other words, it's just about sex, and, but no other time spent together. When a pair bond forms, males and females tend to stay together for a period of time, even when there's not sex taking place. Okay, so I'm distinguishing pair bonds from just sex. So promiscuity bas basically means there's no pair bond taking place. It's just male with female, male with female, any, any male with any female, no exclusive rights, no pair bonding whatsoever. Okay, and typically, then I'm representing sort of, here's the bre one breeding season, now you leave the breeding season, move on to the next breeding season. So I'm sort of showing this temporally as well as, um, as the differences in the pair bond. Simultaneous polygamy is when you have one, typically, most common, one male with many females. And because I use the adjective simultaneous, it means that one male can be with many females pair bond with many females all at the same time. Picture a harem, a stallion with a bunch of mares. That's, that's simul simultaneous polygamy. I'll go into more detail on that in a second. So that's why I show, in, in this particular case, three bars overlapping one another. They're simultaneous. As opposed to the serial polygamy, where one male may mate with a female, and then when uh, pair bond with a female, then break up that pair bond then form a bond with another female and break up, and form a bond with another female and break up, and so on. Serial, a temporal sequence. And then there is monogamy, one male with one female. It can be either seasonal, 
They get together, a male and a female get together for uh, one season. They stay together exclusively for one season, but at the end of the breeding season, they break apart, and at the next breeding season, they may pair bond with different individuals. So you have seasonal monogamy, and then finally, perennial monogamy, where bonds form between a male and a female, and they remain bonded throughout life across the various seasons. So next series of slides shows some examples and defines these terms. So here's promiscuity, the case of um, no exclusive breeding rights and many copulations, no pair bonds. That's an important point to remember for promiscuity. There's no pair bonds taking place. And uh, just a couple pictures of examples. Uh, here's a black bear and here's some uh, African wildebeest. So it's just basically females come in estrus, first male, any male gets there, mating takes place, and then no further pair bonding. Simultaneous polygamy actually falls into two different kinds of strategies, depending upon whether you've got one male and many females or one female and many males. So when you have one male pair bonding with many females, that's referred to as polygyny. So the, you can see the word tells you many females versus one female and many males, polyandry. Okay, and I give some examples for polygyny, one male with many females, blackbirds, fur seals, elk, polyandry, the Jacana, South American bird, female, this is simultaneous polygamy. So what the female does is she um, uh, pair bonds with multiple males, she participates in the building of multiple nests all at the same time, and she doesn't stay with anyone. She, she moves from nest to nest, so there's a simultaneous bonding with multiple males, okay? Or the serial case where you have, again, it can be polygyny or polyandry, one male with many females, but he finishes the pair bond, ends the pair bond with one, moves on to the next, ends the pair bond with that, moves on to the next, and so on. Or in the case of Rias, again, another uh, large bird, Australian bird, the female, uh, a bonds with a male, uh, they build a nest, she lays the eggs, then she abandons that nest and finds another male, mates with him, builds a nest, lays the egg, abandons that one, and so on, and goes on from one to the next to the next, leaving the male the, the task of, of caring, uh, sitting on the eggs, caring for the offspring. That's serial polygamy. Monogamy, pretty straightforward. One male, one female. Duration is one breeding season. And finally, perennial bond is retained for life. And here's some examples of that. Here are lots of these in New Jersey. And sometimes you may see a dead one on the side of the road. And if you look not too far, you might see the, the mate uh, sort of mourning over its, over its loss. And they typically don't reform a new bond. So they're done. All right, we made it. Thank you. Good luck on your exam. See y'all.